So my name is Nuno Palma <coughs> and I'm currently assistant professor of economics at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands but I'm just about to move to the University of Manchester to take up economic history there. So, so I was rather interested in the big questions such as why some countries are poor, others are rich. And uh, so I thought for a while to join development economics, which essentially asks that question for today. But as time went by, I became more and more interested in not so much the cross-section, that is why today some countries are poor, others are rich, but more on the issue of how some countries became rich and others stayed poor because if you go far back in time basically everybody was poor so when I, I, I chose to go into economic history uh, it was still quite uh, on the, on, on not doing very well for it has, a, it has a percentage of economics overall however in the last few years I should say the economic history has been doing relatively well it, from a low base but it has been improving a lot there is now economic history being published in very good journals in economics and so things are improving mm -hmm. I would say what, how, what do you feel are the main issues in economic history now so what are the main questions that are being developed so the questions don't tend to change much as time goes by it's more like how can we arrive to interesting answers that that change the methodologies change more than the questions because the basic question is always the same is why some countries are rich, others mm -hmm. poor, how did that happen? That's, that's, that's the, the bulk of economic history. There's other issues people study in economic history. That, at least that's the one that, impo that matters to me the most. To answer your question though, uh, there is indeed some, some, some issues that people did not tend to look at 15, 20 years ago and now people have been looking at more and this is where economic history is going. So essentially economic history is going in a direction which is more global and comparative in nature as well as quantitative. So now we know a lot more than used to about the economic history of China for instance. And this is important because looking at the failures is an important, uh, an important part of understanding the successes. And of course, I mean the failures from economic history perspective, that is in terms of the past. China today is doing relatively well, but if you go far back in time, in the Middle Ages, China was richer than Europe, actually. Uh, during the Song Dynasty, for instance, China was doing quite well. And, and so at some point things went wrong for parts of the world that had been doing well for a long time, such as China, the, the Ottoman Empire, parts of the uh, um, uh, Arab-speaking world. And so uh, it, it, the economic history has been moving in a direction of trying to understand well what went wrong in those, in those places and why. And that, those kind of, that has causal implications that can also understand us. Mm -hmm. has implications to understanding why poor countries stay poor today as well. Yeah. Um, you presented or presenting a paper in this conference. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yes, so the, the paper I presented uh, is called from, uh, from Convergence to Divergence, Portuguese Economic Growth Over the Long Term, 1500 to 1850. So basically this question uh, reconstructs Portuguese GDP at the annual level all the way back to 1500. So the kind of sources we used to do that are archival sources that come from monasteries, from universities, from hospitals that existed all far back in time into the Middle Ages. For instance, the University of Coimbra already existed in the Middle Ages. So these kind of sources have information about prices, about wages, about land rents that can be used in a variety of ways to reconstruct Portuguese GDP far back in time. And then that has implications again to understand why Portugal by the 19th century is truly a backward economy. When did Portugal start to be backward relative to other countries? Mm -hmm. Was it by the 19th century? Was it by the 18th? How about the 16th century? How was Portugal doing uh, in the 16th century as the discoveries were still on their way? And so these are all kind of questions that now we can answer thanks to these uh, estimates that go mm -hmm. far back in time. Um, you're a relatively young economist. Do you have any tip for someone who, would, who is starting a PhD, as someone who has the memory still very fresh? So I, I think basically, to simplify things a little, there are two strategies that people follow. Uh, one strategy is more or less do what everybody else is doing. 
Uh, and, and that strategy is more successful than you might think because if you do what everybody else is doing it's easy to talk with other people, it's easy to get feedback, it's easy to get in initial interest and a lot of people do that. A different strategy is do something different from what everybody else is doing and maybe it's a bit broad in this term. I followed more the second strategy again by choosing a field like an economic history which was not fashionable at the time by any means and 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 so um, I mean I could tell you something like general in terms of do what you like follow what you like but I do think that you have to consider that these are the two strategies that exist and if you follow the second strategy if you if you go for what you think is important be ready to go through the desert before you can get to results and and, and talk to people mm -hmm. and be able to and and you are actually might get nothing uh, so it's a more risky strategy, the second one, that's for sure. Would you still do the PhD if you, if it was seven years ago and you could tell yourself to do it or not to do it, would you still do, still do it? Absolutely. Okay.